Good evening. We'll be looking at Psalm 95 this evening. Psalm 95, be turning there in your Bibles. As you turn there, I think you'd agree with me that if we were going to be called into the presence of someone who was famous, someone who's very important, that uh, before we made that journey, before we made that appointment, we would make sure that we would uh, dress for the occasion, make sure that we're dressed right. Uh, we might even practice certain things that we would do when we get to where that important person is. I remember a Lucy show many years ago when Lucy and Ricky went to England and uh, Lucy thought she was going to get to meet the queen, so she practiced curtsying. And I think she practiced so much that she threw her back out or something. And anyway, it ended up that she did meet the queen, so uh, she, but she was practicing and she was getting ready. And, and sometimes people will look in the mirror and, and watch themselves to make sure that they're doing things the right way because they don't want to be embarrassed through the situation. Now, oddly enough, people who would take great pains to prepare for someone famous don't necessarily make those great pains when it comes to their appointment with the Lord. They take it casually, or even worse than just simply taking it casually, uh, that they just take it according to ritual. It's just, oh, I just show up and I sit there and I do this and then, you know, go home and that, that's the service. And it, it's really hard to imagine that God would accept something like that. And especially as we read the scriptures that, you know, he constantly is telling us that our heart has to be in it. One of the great condemnations of the Pharisees was that they just did the same thing over and over again, and they didn't think about it. It just got to be where they could uh, kind of put it in idle and get it over with and, and go on. But yet, they never were able to capture the uh, intense emotion that devotion should bring about in our lives. We have this great appointment with God. And Psalm 95 is a call of worship for the children of Israel. And, and I think a lot of what God is trying to tell Israel at that time is, hey, be paying attention that uh, this, this worship that I receive cannot just be something thrown out there. We know in the book of Malachi, God talks about how that Israel would give him the leftovers. They would give him the lame animals and the uh, sacrifices and such. And he says there, you know, offer this to the governor. Yeah, if the governor was coming to your place, you'd set a fine meal for him. But, but look what you're giving me is what God was saying to them. And this is along the same lines of that. It's a call to worship. God calls us to a place, then for this worship, he calls us to a place of beauty, peace, and consciousness that the world cannot provide. That, that there's nothing that the world could ever come close to uh, replicating. You know, often we talk about the little ones that run around here sometimes. Oh, I wish I could take their energy and just bottle it up and sell it or use it myself. And, and, and that's the case with our worship, that it, it needs to be something so great that people would desire to follow along with it and be a part of it because it is something that God desires worship in spirit and in truth. So he calls this. The world can't provide it. The world can't even understand it. As he calls us into the assembly of the saints to worship him. He calls us before his throne. Before his throne. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are at the throne watching us right at this very moment. 
to see what we're doing as, our, as we worship Him. It is the highest privilege to be invited before the throne of the King of Heaven and Earth because not everybody is. We talked this morning from uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 1, that by faith, being justified by faith, we have peace with God and we have an access to God. By being the children of God, we have access, but there are so many people who aren't the children of God and they simply don't know what it means to approach God in spirit and truth. So Psalm 95 teaches us four attitudes of the heart that what we need to develop and constantly keep out before us to make our worship experience pleasing to God. Now, not necessarily pleasing to us, but what happens some, well, I'll talk about that in a moment. But think about it, pleasing to God. We need to be saying, God, what do you want from me? What do you, you know what God wants from us more than anything else? Our hearts. Our hearts, because where our hearts are, that's where our souls are going to be. That, that's where, where your treasure is, say, is where your heart is. And if our heart is with God, he's going to be our treasure. So, the psalmist says that we should come to God, before God, with great joy. And we talked about that this morning. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul says. We rejoice in tribulation. Well, if we rejoice in tribulation, there ought to be a rejoicing in the worship. But here's how the psalmist says it, the uh, first five verses. O come, let us sing to the Lord, let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. Are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. So there are three basic reasons why we are assembling before God and why that assembling should be an occasion for joy. Number one, salvation. Salvation. Neither is there salvation in any other. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. He's the only one that we've got. So we need to approach him because of the salvation. Blessings of life. That, that runs into the thanksgiving. How many times do we find in the book of Psalms, thanksgiving? Worship God with thanksgiving. Thank him for everything. Thank, thank him even for the bad things because, as we talked this morning, bad things help us to grow also. And then God's sovereignty. His sovereignty over nature, see, it talks about in his hand are the deep places of the earth, the heights of the hills are his also, the sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. And, you know, if, if we look at it in the sense of how the Bible speaks about it, it's not just God the Father, it's God the Son who spoke it into existence, it's God the Holy Spirit who did form it molded it, shaped it into what it's supposed to be, and, and molded and shaped us out of the dust of the earth to be what God designed it to be. So we offer him that worship because of these things. So it needs to be joyful. Uh, I, I like to take my kids to amusement. We've been to several because we've lived in several different areas of the country where we were able to do that, some, some really nice places. And you get out to an amusement park and you get in the parking lot and that's when it gets wonderful most of the time. That's when it gets wonderful because you see the kids get out of the cars or get out of the buses. They get out and they, they are just Wow, this is great. This is something. Look at that. This, there's, I'm going to ride that roller coaster, and I'm going to get on this ride over there. And they're joyful because they get to be someplace like that. And we need to be joyful because we get to come 
in the presence of God before his throne to worship and serve him. Now, now also out in that parking lot, you'll see some kids, they'll get out of the car and they'll walk up to the fence. There's always a chain link, link fence around there. And they'll get up there and they'll kind of put their hands in and they'll just look. And they're amazed. Now listen, those kids are just as joyous as the other kids. It's just that the awe is there. The wonder of it all. That's how it is. Sometimes we approach it with the rejoicing, but sometimes we just have to sit back and think with the awe of being in God's presence. He's called me into his presence to worship him. What a wonderful thing it is. Can you imagine? Like with the amusement park, the sights, the sounds, the smells. Think of Israel going to the temple to worship. Now, it was totally different then because it was, well, a lot of it was fleshly. It was, I don't want to say it was worldly, but it was something that was accomplished through the body. And but when they would come up the hill, there'd be singing. The, the priests and the Levites would be out there singing. And uh, sometimes the marching songs, because they were marching to Zion, and they would see the temple in all of its glory, and the priests dressed in their robes and such, and, and the smells, because, you know, when they burned those animals, it smelled bad. But, they put frankincense and other costly things on that fire to produce a sweet-smelling savor. The sights, the sounds, even the smells were something to excite the senses of the Israelites. And it's the same way with us. If our senses are not excited, then how's it going to get to our spirit? How can we say we worship in spirit and truth if we're not communicating to God in a spiritual way? We should come before the Lord with reverence. Reverence. Respect for Him. Highly respecting Him. Because he is the God of all creation. Psalm 95, verse 6. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. When was the last time we kneeled? We, we, we don't do... You go into some buildings of churches and, and there are kneeling pads there because they, they actually bow down and they kneel when they pray. Because it's a matter of respect. Now, now, sure, somebody could kneel down on one of those things and have no reverence for God, whatever, and nothing spiritual coming out of their, their mouths, but yet they understand the concept that God is up here and we are down here. So bowing and kneeling before another person is a sign of respect for that person and a sign of the humility of the individual self. And, and no, we're not supposed to die, bow down before other people, though in certain instances, like Lucy going to see the queen, yes, she would bow down, she would curtsy, because that's the that's what people are supposed to do. But yet I, I remember preaching about Mordecai not too long ago. He said, No way. No way. Especially with Haman. No, he wasn't going to do that. So the reasons we should reverence God are the very same reasons why uh, we rejoice because we're in God's presence. Salvation, blessings of life, thanksgiving, God's sovereignty, His rule over all nature, all creation, which includes us. 
Now, consider that this psalm also calls us to consider <laughs> the great power of God. Great power of God. Verses 3 through 5, his power to create and recreate. To create and recreate. Because, yes, he created the world, he said everything's good, but he destroyed the world and he had to refashion, recreate it. And nothing now is like what was before. The Garden of Eden's gone. It's gone. It, it was destroyed, apparently, in the flood. People still look for it. Why are they looking for it? Why don't they look for the paradise that God has promised when this life is over? His power to forgive will be noticed in verse 7 in particular in God's power to destroy his wrath see to forgive is his mercy to destroy is his wrath and verses 9 through 11 talk about his wrath the complete nature of God ought to bring a great deal of respect and reverence from us for him so bow we, we come to worship with him with joy. We come to worship him with reverence. Number three, we should come before the Lord in communion. And we want to, uh, to put the communion at the table, which it is, but you know that's not necessarily how the scriptures talk about it. All of our worship is communion. Communion. Communication communication with God. If God is a spirit, we must communicate through our spirit. Now, if our spirit is not engaged and it's just coming out of our mouths because that's where we've got it down wrote, you know, we've repeated it so many times that, you know, I've talked before about uh, I've known men who would be asked to wait on the Lord's table and maybe it was the first time in ages they've been asked to wait on the Lord's table and they get up there and they, they'll lead a prayer or something like, Father, thank you for allowing us to be here and as we depart, we pray that you go with us and bring us back at the next point in time. And why is that? Well, it's because it's root. It's just what they've learned. And they don't go beyond, they don't progress, and there's no spiritual connection, communication, communion with God. The verses 7 through 9, for He is our God. He is our God. He's not way over there somewhere and we can't get to Him. He's as close as we, we could touch Him if it wasn't for this He's materialized. He's everywhere. He's there. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. We'll talk someday about sheep. Why are Christians called sheep? Why are God's children called sheep? Well, there's quite a few reasons for that. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your... Now, this is a quotation within this. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they saw my work. Can you imagine that? They saw what God did to the gods of the Egyptians, what they did to the Egyptians, what they did to Pharaoh. They... There was all those people after that last, what was it? After the last, and now the word just escaped me. Hang on. After the destruction of the firstborn son, the Egyptians, Please go. Pharaoh's not smart enough to understand this. 
the priests aren't smart enough. To, the, some of the priests were catching on earlier. This is the finger of God. Plagues. There, there it is, the plagues. After the last plagues. Here, here, take this. Take this gold. Take these fine garments and just go. Your, your God is greater than our gods. You know what they should have been saying? And by the way, take us with you. Take us with you. But God, in his wondrous, amazing foreknowledge, didn't have that happen because once he got the Israelites out in the wilderness, they turned against him. <coughs> they forgot his power all that quickly. <coughs> Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness when your fathers... See, he took them out to be tested to test their faithfulness, whether they would follow him, and they ended up testing his patience. Don't test God's patience. It's the wrong thing to do. They tried me, though they saw my work. So, listen, worship can be naturally divided into two parts. The part where we express our love and devotion to God. We do that in the acts of worship, right? When we pray, when we sing, uh, when we uh, open God's Word, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, when we give, that those are all acts of worship. And, and we do those because of who God is. We, we don't understand this concept about the King. See? If the King came by, how would we act? Well, the King has come by. How do we act? But the worship, see, it's just not what we do. There has to be the part where we listen to God. So how do we listen to God? Do we listen to God? When somebody's leading us in prayer. <coughs> or our hearts and minds somewhere else. Just waiting for the amen so we can pray now. In the songs that we sing, why do we sing these songs? We're communicating to God, but also there's a message from God there. We've got to be careful with the songs that we sing. They're precious, but they're worship. And there's something that please, they, they please God when they're done in spirit and in truth. So we need to hear God in those things and in, 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 in the scriptures as we read them. It's God's word <coughs> to us. And you, just sometimes we might read a verse, a particular verse or a particular passage over and over and over again for years. Quote it. And then hear somebody <coughs> else read it. And all of a sudden we say, I didn't catch that before. I didn't catch that part in it before. I glossed over it before. There's something very uh, uh, alluring, we might say, when we hear God's word spoken. <coughs> That's why as preachers and as teachers, Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Why? Because Bible class this morning, the seed is the word of God. And that's what will grow our faith. So, do we listen? Again, think of some of the things that Jesus talked to the people, told the people. Matthew eleven fifteen. 15, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's in Luke 8 also, isn't it? In the, the parable of the, the sower. But he's constantly saying that. You've got ears, but you've got to listen. Say, I'm sitting on the couch and I'm watching TV and my wife says something. Did you hear me? Yes, I heard you. What did I say? I don't know. I wasn't listening, but I know you said something. That doesn't happen at your house, does it? <laughs> 
But sometimes we hear without listening. But with God, we must listen. Matthew 13, 15 says, For the hearts of the people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. And their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Brothers and sisters, if we can't see God's word in his Bible, and if we can't hear it when it's spoken, it's not going to get into our hearts. Because it's something that's communicated. And a large part of communication is listening. Listening. The majority of problems facing the church today stem from a common problem. Instead of listening to what the Lord wants, people want the Lord to listen to what they want. I had friends in Amarillo. They were so upset. Their, their kids were raised, put it in quotation marks, in the church. But all they talked about, oh yeah, we go over to this church because man, they've got a rocking band. It's not what God wants. Do people want to dictate to God what they want? Oh, you need to accept this. Uh, I remember, I was in high school. Okay? I was in high school, and at the high school in the library, they had Time Magazine. You, you know what Time Magazine is, Connor, don't you? you you've seen Time Magazine. they got stuff from all over the world. In their religion section one time, because you see something like this, and you just can't forget it. It was about a church of New Orleans, and this woman was using her talent to worship God. She was a stripper. But it's my talent, and I get to give that to God. Well, maybe we should just start asking God some fundamental questions. What do you want from us? They fulfill his desires and our worship and our service. So, you know, pay attention and, and listen. Make sure <coughs> it is a communion, and that communion is a two-way street. We need to get something from God out of it. And, and the fourth, we should come before God with commitment. Commitment. Uh, verses 10 and 11. For 40 years, this is again God speaking. He talked about them trying him. Okay? For 40 years I was grieved with that generation and said, It is my people who go astray in their hearts. Where do we go astray first? Where does it start when we go astray? It starts in the heart. We, we, we start desiring other gods. The gods of pleasure, the gods of money, the gods of what have you. Say. We desire those and we go after them. Pleasure. Okay? For 40 years I was grieved with this generation and said, it is, my, it is a people who go astray in their hearts and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, in his wrath, say, I mentioned that just a little bit ago, they shall not enter my rest. They did. They didn't make it to the promised land. Now listen, some of those people might have repented in the wilderness so that we'll see them in heaven. I don't think there's any problem with Moses. The way the New Testament talks about it, and the way Jesus talked about Moses. I don't think there's any problem seeing Moses in heaven. No problem being others. But they didn't make it to the promised land. God says you missed that. So there are times in this world God will let us miss some of the pleasures that are out there. Some of the good things he has for us to teach us a lesson. Hey, you need to straighten up. It grieves God when we approach him and worship with the attitude that we're just going to continue to live the way we've been living, <laughs> the old life. Now, listen, uh, I, I can remember discussions long before I was a Christian in high school with other students talking about God. And there was one girl, uh, she was the same age as Karen, a year behind me in school, and she talked about 
well, yeah, I'm a Methodist, but you know, if I was going to choose, I'd be a Catholic because you just get to do anything that you want to do, and then you just go to the priest and you, you confess it, and it's it's forgiven. You just <clears throat> and it gets kind of like that with other religions, does it? Oh, I'll just do what I want to do, and, I, and I'll ask God to forgive me. And then it'll be okay. But see, God looks at the heart, and he knows where the heart is. So it grieves him when, when people act that way. Now, to the Pharisees, scribes, lawyers, Matthew 15, 7 and 8, Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but, here comes that word again, their heart is far from me. It's the heart. That's what's important. It's just not saying some words. You know, uh, I, I've got friends who are Catholic, I've got friends who are Lutheran, and when we talk, you know, they're amazed. Oh, you know, like if we're eating and, and I lead a prayer, then, oh, you know, when we do it, we just say the same prayer for everything. They, they've got approved prayer. So, you know, the, the Lutheran will say one prayer, and it's blah, 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 blah. He's got it memorized. But that's what you do, like it's some magical incantation. <laughs> Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We must approach God as that new creation. Not old world people trying to be Christians but being the new creation Christian and worshiping and serving God in spirit and in truth. So in conclusion, it's a great privilege to be called before the throne of God to worship Him. We have to do it in fullness of our being, body, mind, and spirit. That's how He created us. Yes, there are body things. He calls us to come to worship on the first day of the week. Just not spiritual. He calls us to come together to assemble to do that body. And he wants us to use our minds to understand things that are going on. And he wants our spirits to be in communion, communication with him. To praise him in song and in prayer for his marvelous works of salvation. Thank <laughs> him. Say, remember what he's done for us. So, those are the four attitudes that this psalm says we should possess as we worship God. Joy, reverence, communion, commitment. Because that's what God desires from us. The lesson is yours. Thank you so much for your time. If you have any needs this evening, let your request be made known as we stand and sing the invitation song.